Thank you very much. We are here to bring you the story behind the music you love and to introduce you to the men who make that music at Orchestra Hall. You'll also get to hear an informal and easy to understand discussion of music and its interesting personalities. And what's more, you listening right now have an opportunity to win two main floor tickets for a concert by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And today let's open your symphony scrapbook to the pages devoted to that genial but tricky instrument, the French horn. And we have with us Mr. Arthur Goldstein, member of the horn section of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, to tell us about this important instrument. Mr. Goldstein, I'm sure our listeners would uh, like to uh, have you identify for them the selection you played at the beginning of this program. Uh, and that, perhaps play some more from it. That was the hornpipe from the uh, sweet Much Ado About Nothing by Korngold. <laughs> Since you're a newcomer to the uh, orchestra this year and newcomer to this program, I think it'd be of interest to our audience to uh, have you introduce yourself by telling us something about your background, your early training, how you came to take up the uh, horn, and about uh, your previous symphonic experience. Well, originally I played trumpet. Uh, at the same time, I had a brother who was playing clarinet. And uh, actually, at that time, we didn't know too much about the French horn. We hadn't uh, heard it, and, uh, well, there was one interesting program on the radio that seemed to interest us. Uh, it interest, uh, interested us from two points of view, one uh, for the uh, content of the story and uh, the other because of the music. And that, uh, I'm sure everybody knows it, is uh, The Lone Ranger. Now, of course, the story, well, we understand everybody likes that. As far as the music goes... Well, it starts off with a, a trumpet call, which goes something like this. Go on. Well, about a few measures after the uh, trumpet starts, uh, two French horns come in. And for quite a while, we wondered what instrument that was, until somebody explained it to us. And, uh, of course, we were quite fascinated with the sound of the instrument. The horns play this little part. seemed to convert us, and uh, we started to study horn, and I uh, studied with Mr. Joseph Franzel, who's now in New York, following which I went into the Army, and afterwards went to the New England Conservatory of Music, where I studied horn with uh, Mr. Willem Falconier. First horn player of the Boston Symphony. That's right. And, uh, well, while I was in Boston, I played in various places around town, such as the Pops and the New England Woodwind Quintet, and did uh, various Broadway uh, stage shows. And uh, afterwards, when I graduated, I went to Buffalo, where I spent two years with Steinberg. And between the two years, I played with the St. Louis Sinfonietta. And after that, I came to Chicago. Well, we're glad to uh, have you with us, and it's an interesting uh, story of how you came to take up that instrument. 
And now I think it's appropriate that uh, we announce that we're glad to send a pair of tickets uh, for a concert by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra for, for, to Mrs. C.A. Prock of Elmhurst, uh, because she sends in a question that's very appropriate uh, to this program, and which I'll throw at you for an answer, Mr. Goldstein. She says, why is the French horn reputed to be so tricky or difficult to play? Well, that question is slightly technical, but I think we can get through it. Uh, all instruments have a series of harmonics. And, uh, well, harmonics, uh, the easiest way to explain it would be by taking a bugle, and all the notes that a bugle plays are harmonics. It has no valves or any fake way to play a note. Everything is true and natural. Now, the horn, being a larger instrument, uh, has many more of these open notes. And uh, the most beautiful part of the horn is in the upper part of these open notes. Whereas, for instance, the trumpet player plays in a lower section of these notes, the horn player is always playing quite high. And the higher one goes, the uh, closer these notes get to each other. You mean higher in the scale? That's right. For instance, uh, well, way down low. You see those notes are spaced uh, quite far apart. As you go higher, however, you can get the notes very close until finally you just can't tell the difference between one note and the next. Now that's playing without the use of valves. Well, that's right. Now the difficulty would consist in what? And in separating the notes? And separating the note. Uh, the notes, that is. Now, uh, when you... You're sitting in the orchestra, you have so many measures rest, and all of a sudden uh, the music calls for coming in on some very, very high note, quite softly. You just have to pick out that right one. And if you don't pick out the right one, well, that's why this woman feels that the horn sounds as it does. Well, I remember reading about someone saying of the horn that you have to humor it in the weak spots. But I judge then that uh, there are quite a few weak spots? Oh, yes. Well, the, uh, I judge then that you would say that the improvements that have been made on the horn through the crooks and uh, uh, lately the valves uh, have improved the horn, but by no means um, improved a lot of the horn player? Well, no, they, it has made it considerably easier, but it's still quite difficult. Is such a thing as a trill a very difficult play to, thing to play on the horn? Yes. Uh, there are several types of trills. Uh, in as much as we have valves now, it's quite possible to trill with valves. Uh, I wonder if you could give us an illustration of that. Two notes that are very closely together. Well, how could that be illustrated, say, from uh, symphonic literature? Yes. In uh, Wagner's Siegfried uh, Idol, at the end of the solo, there is a trill. That sounds like it uh, ends quite abruptly. However, the orchestra does come in and uh, resolves that trill. Or saves the situation? Yes. Now, it, the uh, horn players, I've, uh, I know, look upon themselves as a very close-knit uh, team. I read an article recently on the horns in the symphony orchestra pointing out that you really have a basic quartet. And sometimes you have six horns. Some orchestras, I know the, the Boston Symphony always has had eight. Uh, now, is that a sort of a relief team? Is there a difference between the offensive and the defensive uh, horn teams? Well, actually, the Boston Symphony, I believe, had nine at one time. And uh, they had two quartets. In as much as uh, when uh, the orchestra would put on a heavy program and uh, the horn players would get tired, they might split the concert up and have one... <coughs> team come in first half and the other team come in for the second half 
and this proved uh, fairly su successful. Now, in uh, Chicago, we have six. Now, how are those divided? Well, uh, you have your regular four, and uh, and various pieces where uh, you have to give relief. Relief is given to the first horn and the third horn, where the relief is most needed, in as much as uh, the high parts, and those are the men that get a bit t more tired. Uh, of course, there are some pieces of music that are written for six horns, and of course, there's no question there. I was very much interested in uh, running across a couple of uh, books that uh, you wrote. Uh, was that fairly recently on the uh, certain complete methods for horns and uh, uh, woodwinds that have a distinctly humorous uh, twist? I was wondering if you could tell us something about those. Well, they were written uh, while I was at school. Uh, we, the people I lived with, uh, other students, we had been compiling a lot of jokes and comical bits about the difficulties of playing horn and other instruments. And uh, well, I finally got courage enough to invest a little money and have it printed. And it seems to have turned out quite well. Well, they're uh, very interesting. Are they, uh, have they just been privately circulated or publicly? Well, they've been uh, privately circulated. However, uh, it has been quite successful in as much as it's been not only all over the United States, but it has gone to foreign countries also. I think it's rather, um, the illustrations are particularly interesting. You take on various disguises in these uh, photographs. Well, I did grow a beard for one of the pictures. I think anyone interested in horn or woodwind playing would be interested in looking through those uh, uh, two booklets. Well, the horn we know is a fairly familiar instrument to uh, concert goers, and... Uh, I have a feeling that Tchaikovsky must be a favorite uh, composer of uh, horn players. Is that so? Yes, I uh, believe that he played horn at one time himself. And I think it would be appropriate if we could uh, have something from Tchaikovsky. Uh, I'll play the uh, introduction to uh, Symphony Number no. 4. question I'd like to uh, ask, and that is uh, why some horn players seem to continually polish their horns and others to leave them unpolished. Well, most horn players do polish their horns. Of course, this doesn't last very long, uh, perhaps a week or so, and then the horns start to get dirtier and dirtier. Some horns are lacquered and they don't need cleaning. However, I believe that most of the horns are not clean because most of the horn players are quite lazy or else they have uh, too much other to do. Well, thanks, Mr. Goldstein, for this um, very interesting addition to our scrapbook, which I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed very much.